Now, I'm just going to uh, run through a few uh, things I think that we should be aware of within many years, a subject which has been fairly sleepy for quite a few years, but a few things have uh, developed in the last couple of years, which um, we're going to reflect on um, this afternoon. So I'm going to look at uh, the updated classification. It's really important that when you're defining your patients with vertigo, that we're all using the same uh, nomenclature. Um, the BMED trial um, is a very important trial in relationship to CERC, which you ought to be aware of. And I want to present our own um, results from uh, Imperial, um, looking at interesting panic treatments. So the updated classification, it's fairly um, simple. Um, most of you who attend regularly will have heard Joel Goebel speak, um, a very great friend of this section. So through the auspices of the Barani Society, um, he headed up a team who just looked at the traditional 1995 AHO um, classification uh, and have essentially uh, consolidated it to some extent. Um, Joel always jokes that certain many heirs of the uh, previous classification is the one you definitely don't want to have as it's post-mortem. And so not a very useful clinical uh, diagnosis and possible many heirs disease of course, there just means you've got a vertiginous patient. You can't really define uh, what the problem is. So that's gone out, and we're left with definite and probable. The main feature, apart from the episodic vertigo, which is better defined now, is that the low frequency sensory neural hearing loss can be before, during, or after the attacks. It used to be that ideally you'd find and capture the acute low frequency hearing loss at the time of the attack. Now, as we all know, access to audiology is difficult. Often in a continental setup where there's an otology clinic on every corner, people present quickly, they can be captured, the certainty of the diagnosis is greater. But it's much more practical, essentially, to have that characteristic audiogram. It may be chronic, but it is in keeping with a definite diagnosis. So thanks to Joel, we can use that um, as a structure um, for defining the patients, both clinically and in a research setting. Now, CERC. The um, role of CERC, when I came into ENT 25 years ago, um, CERC was a very well-established treatment. And it must have been until I was involved externally in the BMED trial um, as an external referee, um, I must have been, I'd never really looked at where on earth CERC came from. Um, and if you go back to the 60s, um, vasodilators were very popular <laughs> as treatments for a variety of different neurological conditions, um, cerebrovascular disease in particular. So people with strokes, TIAs, uh, Parkinson's, all sorts of things were given vasodilators. And if you remember back to your days as a medical houseman and using vasodilators for um, cardiac problems, you'll remember they're pretty unpleasant um, drugs. But CERC was the one of that family which was very clean, very few side effects. So it became popularized in using for all sorts of different neurological conditions. And then the jump was made to say that many as we think has some microvascular um, uh, cause and therefore CERC could be of use. If we go to Cochrane, um, the last um, update uh, was 2010 for um, CERC, and essentially um, there's no great evidence from past studies um, on its use. Um, the suggestion was that the actual uh, quality of the trials was relatively poor, um, none showed uh, any effect on hearing loss, um, there may be a reduction of vertigo, but it's a pretty lukewarm uh, conclusion, um, and really of a really good randomized controlled trial, there was an entire absence truly in this area. So um, it's very good that Hulk is here today with us because it was his German colleagues um, who uh, set up the um, BMED trial, um, looking at a true randomized controlled trial of CERC. Um, when um, CERC is given, there seems to be a great variety of practice um, of the dose that's given. Um, and the person probably uh, internationally whose name is most associated with research in this area uh, is Michael Strupp, who uh, works from uh, Munich. And in vitro um, guinea pig uh, studies looking at the effects on um, blood supply, 
would suggest that actually we need to be giving doses pretty high up, 48 milligrams, um, to get close to a maximum vasodilation within the cochlea. Um, here in the animal model, they're using doses of up to 160 milligrams. And the 16 milligrams that most commonly is probably given this country is probably only having half the effect it might have done. So the BEMA trial was very well constructed, and there were a number of things about it which um, are very meritorious. So it's multi-center um, perspective. It was definite patients, though uh, unilateral and bilateral patients were included. That's always a slight issue um, in many years' research. Um, going all the way back to the sham study, um, which we're all supposed to know about, one of the great criticisms of the sham study in Denmark, where I did my fellowship, was that they included unilateral and bilateral patients. It's very hard to know which ear is the problem. Um, and so it's much easier if you stick to unilateral. But the structure was randomised between placebo, low-dose and high-dose um, uh, regimes. Um, the results were at seven to nine months. We are supposed to get beyond 18 months with interventions for many years to allow um, a really uh, valid outcome. Um, one of the strengths of the study was that telephone interviews were done to try and differentiate between hypofunction. If you've got many airs, at least one of your cochleas will not work well. When you move quickly, you will get brief episodes of disequilibrium. And often patients will interpret that as an attack. Whereas we all know the really acute irritative attack is the thing that we're really focusing on. And this was very well followed up to make sure that the questionnaires really matched the patient experience. Now, the study is complicated in its results, and there are a number of ways they graphically represented um, the uh, results. It's a jumble, a real jumble. You can get the impression, as so often with many years of research, that at the time of recruitment, the patients were getting a lot of attacks, and that they are trending downwards over time. But in looking between placebo, low and high dose, there is no significance in outcome at all. And this is, without doubt, the best piece of research ever done on CERC. And as a result, um, so I was the referee for the paper when it came out in the BMJ. And um, I wrote um, uh, an editorial for the BMJ, um, along with uh, Stefano Constantino. He's an academic in Cambridge um, who is the uh, medical advisor to the Menier Society. Um, and we used it as a platform just to remind GPs of a few things. Um, the first is, it's a rare condition, on average, a GP with an average caseload will only see two or three cases in his whole or her whole career. And generally they see 10 to 20 new cases of vertigo under one auspices or another. Um, and so we all know how often CERC is given. It's so rare, even if it did work, that they are actually treating the right patient with the right um, uh, medication. And so we did put in this rather uh, edgy statement that we're trying to break this lazy adoption. Just give them CERC, refer them in, try and adopt, try and work out the problem you've got. We know they have a little amount of time, but as I'm sure you've all found, it hasn't really changed the practice, but it was an attempt. Now, our own, uh, our own work. So this came out of um, um, uh, work that uh, was being discussed um, 10 years ago. Um, again, uh, somebody who's um, come through uh, otology over the last 20, 25 years, the name of Shuknek um, is uh, premier. I mean, he was such a famous and contributory scientist and surgeon. It's amazing to think that he was doing intratympanic injections 60 years ago. It was originally ablative. They recognized the problems with systemic um, streptomycin damaging both ears. Um, he did cadaver studies. It's really first-class work. And over time, we've moved away from streptomycin to gentamicin. Um, and gentamicin intratermic injections has become the gold standard um, of treatment. Um, this is probably the best meta-analysis of gentamicin um, for many years. And um, the attempt of this paper was to look at whether there was any difference in outcome looking at all the different regimes. Um, there are many different types, single dose, multiple dose, titration, meaning you keep giving it until the patient uh, develops a vertiginous episode suggesting that ablation has been occurred. Um, and on the Foxbot, you get a very, very good outcome in terms of vertigo control as the primary aim of gentamicin. So it's a very successful treatment, but it comes at a cost 
Um, looking at functional level, so this is just looking at how the patients manage on a day-to-day -day basis with simple tasks, dressing yourself, washing yourself, things like that. Pre-treatment, yes, pretty poor. It's a very symptomatic disease. But even after successful treatment of the acute irritative attacks, there is still a significant poor functional outcome in many. You may stop the acute attacks, but you may leave the patients with a chronic disequilibrium, and that is not satisfactory. So, at the BSNO um, in 2007, the British Society of Neurotology, um, for any of you who are very interested in vestibular disease and treatment and research, um, it's a uh, biannual um, event. Um, the next one is at Guy's in October. Um, and at the meeting in 07, um, we had a visiting speaker from the States who was discussing outcome with panic dexamethasone, high dose, 24 milligrams. And um, this was just a report of practice, but it engendered a discussion about whether steroids really did match up to gentamicin. Um, and in terms of uh, the idea, so Adolfo Bronstein and I took the idea away, we looked at it, it was clearly to make it work, it'd have to be a prospective randomized control trial. We needed money, and we have a parent uh, academic fund, but the Menier Society underwrote the majority of the research funds, um, and that was a uh, sum of almost 300,000 pounds um, over seven years, very generous of it. So gentamicin is the gold standard. We stuck by the AAHNS uh, criteria, um, so it's a two-year follow-up. But because it's so long, we felt that a placebo arm was not appropriate. Now, that is the weakness of this study. Um, there are ethical issues either way. It was a nationwide recruitment, um, and uh, the power calculation suggested we needed 30 in each arm. Um, after about three to four years, we hadn't recruited enough people, so we approached Leicester as a big balance centre, and they provided um, the last eight or nine patients. In terms of which steroid, which is really where the conversation started, um, there is uh, animal work suggesting that methylprednisolone um, does have better pharmacokinetics within the inner ear than other steroids. Um, 24 milligrams per mil dexamethasone is not generally available. Um, it was last produced in about 2005. Solumedrone you'll find in buckets around your hospital because the orthopedic and rheumatology people use it a great deal for joint troubles or muscular problems. So solumedrone we used because it's so available. We wanted to have a practical um, element to this research. So here was the structure of the um, trial. We decided on two injections um, to try and give validity to the study. Um, I did virtually all the injections myself, um, and sometimes patients will not settle, not speak and swallow for 20 minutes, ideally trapping the steroid in the middle ear. We felt if we'd done two, that that gave much more certainty that we'd actually effectively treated them. Um, if there was a drop between the first um, and the second planned injection, then they got a dummy. And part of the cost of the trial was that all the patients were seen uh, repetitively over 24 months. Questionnaires, yes, but they were tested on every single attendance, including a speech audiogram, caloric, VEMP, a special utricular test as well, and a rotating chair. So a lot of vestibular data um, gained through this. We went through so many patients to try and find the 60. It's amazing how many patients were referred with a diagnosis of many years with no associated hearing loss, probably migraine, a lot to exclude. We found our 60 having um, uh, ethically sat with the patients, discussed the potential risk if they got gentamicin of disequilibrium, and 30 were uh, randomized. We lost uh, two patients from the gentamicin arm, one withdrew and one was lost to follow up. And on the 30 who went down the steroid arm, two crossed over to gentamicin. We had an internal control of a, of a unblinded neurotologist who, if the patients continue to get symptoms, um, Barry Seamungal, who's spoken here a few times, would assess if they would have a further injection or in rare cases would cross over to the gold standard treatment. That has a small effect in terms of just the statistics, rather like the target trial we're on to intention to treat and how you handle those two patients who started on the steroid side but moved over to gentamicin. Um, and so we analyzed it on the intention to treat basis, so as if they had just had steroids, or removing them 
by um, recognizing they went into the gentamicin arm. But the results have been very positive. So if you capture a diary of vertiginous episodes over the six months before the end of the trial or just over a month, in both analyses, there is a huge reduction in vertigo with the interventions on both sides, suggesting as our primary outcome that methylprednisolone is as good as gentamicin for control. And you can reanalyze in a number of questionnaire um, types, but one of the most important thing is looking at overall dizziness um, handicap as well as functional level. And in all cases, you do better with steroids than gentamicin, which is what you'd expect on the basis of how they're acting. We also did better in terms of tinnitus and better in our, there is a, um, a validated questionnaire about oral fullness as well. So they do genuinely seem to do well on all aspects. And in reverse, in terms of vestibular testing, as you'd expect with the gentamicin, if you average the canal paresis, then it's going to greatly increase in the gentamicin arm, but we had no change with the steroids. Same if you look at a vemp asymmetry, same sort of thing, suddenly a big asymmetry after gentamicin, not really very much change in steroids. Um, UCF, that's a utricular function, very complicated to explain. Again, we're doing better, and with rotational gain, again, much better. No real change, no detriment to their vestibular function. In terms of adverse outcomes, um, patients get severe short-term side effects with gentamicin. And um, we had eight patients who, after gentamicin, were very unwell. Um, two had to be admitted. That's always got to be part of your care of these patients. But with methylprenzolone, we'd had a single case after a single injection. Um, often a complaint, a criticism of methylprednisolone is the stinging um, pain that you get when you inject it. To be biologically available, it has to be acidic. So there's no point in buffering it because you'll lose the effect of the, um, the drug. Um, and we blinded, um, compared pain with the two. There wasn't any significant difference, though there was a trend for methylprednisolone to be more painful. Um, many of you will be aware of the uh, pilot studies looking at gels of steroids injected into the middle ear for many years, um, the ESO 104 uh, work. One of the problems they've had is with long-term high-dose steroid inside the middle ear, there is a significant perforation rate afterwards. Um, all our patients had tympanometry after uh, injection. We had no perforations throughout um, the, the whole of the study. So um, I want to pay tribute. Adolfo is our leader. He's the person, he's the academic, um, who really uh, was able to make this um, work. Um, I learned a huge amount um, by um, running and being part of a randomized controlled trial. They're pretty rare in ENT. It's taken 10 years from the BSNO meeting of talking about it to be able to stand here and give you the results. It took 18 months to get ethics. You know all the problems, but I would strongly encourage you to uh, engage with these sort of projects. If you have an academic interest, it's there to be done. A few final thank yous. Lester were very helpful to give us the final um, Patients and Peter Ray oversaw that side of things. Uh, many of you referred patients to us uh, to be included in the trial, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, and the patients themselves to take on the risk of chronic disequilibrium with a gentamicin injection, but with the hope that we would produce useful clinical material at the end was extremely uh, brave of them all. And of course, my colleagues at Charing Cross. Thank you. Thank you.